Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this psych video, we're going to be discussing additional depressive disorders. And we've already talked about major depressive disorder in our previous video, so go check that out. But in this video, we're going to be talking about the other depressive disorders you may need to know for the USMLE Step 1. This is also pretty high yield, so let's just write that down so you guys do not forget this content. Will you be tested in it? Eh, possibly. Now, when it comes to our YouTube channel, don't forget that we also have a psych playlist on our channel. So go check it out for all your psych video and content needs. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. And with that being said, let's begin and let's talk about the other depressive disorders. So there are pretty much four main things you need to know, more four main depressive disorders, and they are called depression with atypical features, MDD, major depressive disorder with seasonal pattern, persistent depressive disorder, and finally postpartum mood disturbances. All of these are pretty important. You should definitely have a good understanding of what happens. And specifically within the postpartum mood disturbances, there are three that you should know. And we're gonna be talking more about these uh, as we go along in this video lecture. So let's first start talking about depression with atypical features. So depression with atypical features, in this type of depression, Patients have something called mood reactivity, which means they're able to react to pleasurable stimuli. In normal de uh, depression, patients don't really react to uh, pleasurable stimuli. They've lost control of their emotions. But in this case, they have somewhat uh, or some control of their emotions. They have the ability to react with pleasurable stimuli. But another thing that ends up happening in this case is that patients usually end up getting uh, gaining weight due to hyperphagia and hypersomnia. So they eat a lot and they sleep a lot. That's not usually common. A lot of times patients don't usually gain a lot of weight in depression. They usually lose weight and then they become insomniacs, whether it's initial, middle, or end insomnia, uh, sleep insomnia. It's usually more uh, insomnia they get rather than hypersomnia. Patients also get something called uh, leaden paralysis where they have a heavy feeling in their arms and legs and they're sensitive to rejection. That I thought was pretty interesting because in normal depression, those patients may have a flat affect, but in depression with atypical features, patients are sensitive to rejection. I don't know why, but that always stuck out to me because I guess that's just a different type. Now this, surprisingly, is the most common subtype of depression. This is the most common type that happens. And to treat this, you're going to use cognitive behavioral therapy and SSRIs. Uh, MAOI, or monoamine oxidase inhibitors, are effective, but they're not the first sign because of their risk and their side effect profile that occurs with them. So you want to treat them with CBT and SSRIs. Just like with all depression, usually the first sign treatment for even the, the additional depressive disorders that we've talked about, that we're going to talk about, are going to be cognitive behavioral therapies and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like fluoxetine, paroxetine, and sertraline. Okay, so those are the ones you definitely, definitely want to know. So that is depression with atypical features. Moving on to major depressive disorder with seasonal patterns. Now this is formally known as uh, seasonal, uh, seasonal affective disorder. And if you guys watch uh, The Office, there's a little scene where Toby complains about suffering from seasonal affective disorder. Anyways, The Office aside, uh, the seasonal affective disorder is something that is quite common and it can happen in the workplace um, and it usually lasts greater than two years with two or more major depressive episodes associated with the change in the pattern. Now surprisingly this usually happens in the winter because during the winter months the sun it, the daylight is short right the daytime is very short it's more dark time it's cold you stay indoors a lot so a lot of these things end up affecting people and they end up going through something called uh, MDD with seasonal patterns and they have atypical depression symptoms as well in this situation patients are going to be hypersomnia they're going to have hyperphagia and they're going to have leaden paralysis as well so just think about, you know, seasonal depression. If they are inside, they're going to probably eat a lot because they're also depressed due to having atypical symptoms. And they're also going to be, you know, hypersomniacs because they don't want to go outside. It's already, it gets dark sooner, so they may sleep 
more and longer. And that's how I uh, internalize or that's how I remember the hypersomnia portion. So that knocks out two of the additional depressive disorder. Let's go to our third one, which is called persistent depressive disorder. And this is called dysthymia or the dysthymia, uh, dysthymic disorder. So dysthymia is often milder than uh, uh, major depressive disorder. And in this case, you can see patients having greater than or equal to two depressive symptoms, like the ones we've talked about for MDD. But these symptoms are going to last greater than or equal to two years with no more than two months without depression. So it's pretty much a very mild, in the way I like to form it, mild form of MDD that lasts, uh, that long lasting. That's how I always thought about uh, dysthymia, meaning they have MDD, but it's very mild, and it happens for a long period of time, uh, over two years. And finally, postpartum mood disorders. That's the last main type of other depression that you definitely need to know of. And in this, the first type is going to be postpartum blues. Now, this is very common. It's characterized by de a depressed feeling after uh, two to three days after delivery. This is a very quick onset. It happens. The mother might feel sad. They might feel uh, fatigued and tired. But this usually goes away in 10 days. And it's quite common, surprisingly. Even I didn't know this, but it usually occurs in 50 to 85% of patients and the treatment for this is simply supportive now this is very important because postpartum blues is different than something called postpartum depression postpartum depression on the other hand is characterized by a depressed affect anxiety and poor concentration for greater than two weeks just like it is for MDD right MDD has to be greater than or equal to two weeks uh, in this case it's the same thing but it's after uh, uh, delivering a baby. And it, this actually does require medical treatment. It's not self-resolving. Uh, and it usually occurs in a minority of patients, 10 to 15%. Uh, and the treatment for this is, like we said earlier, CBT and SSRIs. Now, usually what will end up happening on the USMLA Step 1 is that they're going to try to trick you into thinking that a patient has postpartum depression or postpartum blues when they actually have the opposite disease. So if they have blues, they actually have depression. And the way they trick you is that they say, what is, you know, a patient will call in and say, hey, I've been feeling sad, depressed ever since I gave birth, and you're their ob -GYN. What is your best response to this case? And the way to realize that is by determining what is going on. If a patient calls you within two to three days and you say, oh, you know what, they have blues, then the optimal answer is going to be, okay, why don't you follow up with me within two weeks and then we'll reassess. This is normal. This will go away. Call me back in two weeks. That's what you want to say to patients who have postpartum blues. Now, patients who have postpartum depression, that you want to treat differently. Now, in this case, the vignette is going to set you up by telling you that they've been feeling this way for about two, like 14 to 20 days, right? More, greater than or equal to two weeks. And that should clue you into postpartum depression. And in this case, you want to tell them, why don't you come into the office? Let's get you evaluated. And then we're going to get you started on CBT or SSRIs. So it's very easy to get mixed up, but it's very simple if you understand the minute differences between postpartum blues and postpartum depression. Now, when it comes to postpartum uh, psychosis, on the other hand, this is completely different. And this is very rare. This is characterized by mood, uh, congruent delusions, hallucinations, and thoughts of harming the baby or self. So if patients who are coming in with psychosis, they're going to have psychotic features of hallucinations. This is right. Hallucinations, delusions, and uh, disorganized, I'm sorry, disorganized thoughts or speech. 
right? They're going to have these symptoms of psychosis. And within these symptoms of psychosis, the delusions, hallucinations might precipitate the patient thinking they have to harm themselves or their baby. This is very rare, but this is a sort of emergency. So risk factor for this would be a patient who has bipolar or psychotic disorders to begin with. They may have had a previous history of postpartum psychosis. And this is the most important indicator of a patient who might have a recurrent episode of postpartum psychosis. If they've had it before, they could have it again. For some odd reason, the very first pregnancy is uh, at risk of having the mother develop postpartum psychosis. We don't know why, but that can happen. Uh, a family history is also very important. If there's a family history of postpartum psychosis, then it should clue you in to be you know, very careful in case this patient develops postpartum psychosis. Now in this case, the treatment is gonna be hospitalization and you wanna initiate atypical or second generation uh, antipsychotics. We've talked about those in the schizophrenia video, but you definitely wanna initiate those. Um, you can also use antidepressants and mood stabilizers like lithium and valproic acid. Now, when it comes to the second generation, uh, uh, second generation uh, antipsychotics, you wanna look out for the main ones uh, on the USMA step one. So something like olanzapine, I'm just gonna write them down for you guys. Risperidone and quetiapine. Oops. All right. So these are the main three that you should keep in the back of your mind when it comes to the atypical antipsychotics. And at the end of the day, you can use electroconvulsive therapy because some of the drugs can affect the child through the breast milk. Now, these are the main things you need to know for postpartum psychosis. I think this is a very high yield uh, information slide. I don't think that it's very commonly tested, but in case you are tested on postpartum psychosis and postpartum mood disorders, you should be pretty well off with all this information. Now with that being said, thank you so much for watching. I hope this helped. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. And if you guys are interested, if you guys want, you guys can go check out our podcast on all of the main streaming services like Apple Music, Spotify, Google, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in our podcast, we are actually posting our USMLE Step 1 content so you guys can listen to it while you're running, going to the clinic, going to school, et cetera, et cetera. So go check that out if you guys are interested. Just search Mad Medicine and you'll easily find us. And with that being said, thank you so much for watching and go ahead and continue on to the next video.